minutes past the hour. Uh, hello and welcome to the second installment of our monthly virtual office hour series. Uh, my name is Bill Wynn and I am the Director of Customer Success here at TechSoup. Uh, joining, joining me today on our panel are Marilyn DeMorris, our account manager on our cloud solutions team, uh, Shruti Ramaswamy, our VP of strategy, uh, Vanessa Jimenez, who is our customer success manager, and she will be helping me moderate um, today's meeting, making sense of your Microsoft Cloud licenses, part two. Um, Kevin, Kevin Mohal is our technical success manager who will be uh, presenting today's, um, today's demo. A few housekeeping items before we start. Please use the chat function to type in your questions and comments. We will collect the questions and answer them during the Q&A portion of this session. In fact, you can start using the chat feature now by saying hello, which some of you have, have already done, and write where you're attending this conversation from. I'm personally dialing in from the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, for easier access for closed captioning, please click on the ellipsis and then turn on live captioning. Mm -hmm. um, and please note that this session is being recorded. The recording and slides will be available shortly for everyone who is registered for this event. Mm -hmm. uh, before we start the demo, we would like to know what your experience level is with 365. Mm -hmm. um, this poll is optional, so don't feel like you have to answer. Mm -hmm. It just helps us understand our audience better. Um, and when you're done, you can choose, uh, you can close out the pop-up window when you're done, or uh, if you don't feel like answering, you can also uh, close out the window. Okay, and that's the, uh, that's the quick poll we have. Feel free to answer or not. Yep, and use the polling, uh, use the polling feature there. I'm going to go ahead and answer with uh, basic experience. Okay, um, mm -hmm. so I see one person with advance and for the most part we are basic. And then a little bit of none. Okay, this is very helpful. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kevin Mohal who will be leading this conversation and doing demos. Kevin. Thanks, Phil. A pleasant good morning, afternoon or evening to those joining us today. Again, my name is Kevin Mahal. I'm a Technical Customer Success Manager here at TechSoup. And today's virtual office hour session, we'll be discussing the following topics. Creating users, assigning licenses and roles in your 365 admin home portal. Next, we're going to take a brief look at tenant user roles and the concept of role-based access control. We'll then touch on downloading Office desktop applications before moving on how to add a custom domain. Then finally, and for the majority of the session, we'll be opening the floor to any questions you may have. I'm gonna go ahead and switch over here to my demo account. Bear with me one second. To access the admin homepage, you'll need to log in at the following URL admin.microsoft.com. Once logged in, mm -hmm. it will arrive at the home page that you see here. To add a user, you'll scroll over to the left side dashboard where it reads users. Click the down arrow, select active users. And from the screen that you're redirected to, simply click add a user. This is going to walk you through the wizard for adding a user. We'll start with first name. So I'm going to go ahead and add myself to this demo account. Please note all the information that's contained in this account that you're seeing is fictitious. It's a demonstration account. It's only meant for providing information. So you can see here after I've added my first name and last name, Microsoft went ahead and populated that in a display name. 
You can, of course, change this. It does not need to match here. But for simplicity's sake, I'm going to go ahead and keep it as is. For the username, this is something that you might be familiar with. This is actually something called a user principal name. You know this is an alias. I recommend using the first initial of the first name and then the last name as standard policy. So I'm going to go ahead and use my first and last name on this. We're not going to pay attention to the domain here for the moment being. We'll come back to that. You'll see here there's a couple of check mark, check mark boxes here that read automatically creating a password, require this user to change their password, and then to send password and email upon completion. The one item I would like to pay attention to here is the sending password and email upon completion. Now you'll see here that the domain that's listed is a dot on Microsoft domain level. Now say that you were a church group of 10 people mm -hmm. and one of your staff does not have a standard domain, custom domain listing, and you're not keen on using it on Microsoft to communicate this information. Say they have a Gmail or a Yahoo account, you can actually go ahead and change this to that email client. In this case, in this example, I'll just use Yahoo, and then I'll go ahead and send that here. Afterwards, you'll want to click Next, and then we're going to go into Product Licenses. By default, the location, as it was the licenses were requested in the United States, will be set to the United States. The licenses that you do request and are provisioned will populate here under the licenses. In this particular example, I'm going to go ahead and then just select Office 365 E3 in my demo account. Note, you can also create a user without a product license. When I clicked and highlighted the Office 365 E3 account, you may have noticed that the apps keyword here updated to the number 27 in parentheses. By clicking on this, what this allows you to do is to granularly control what applications the user has access to. By default, it's going to highlight everything. This is a decision, of course, you can make. I just wanted you to be aware that you have the ability to say, for example, deprovision access to something like Microsoft Bookings. Say that you have another calendar tool that you use and you don't want your colleagues to be using Bookings. You can certainly deselect that. And when they go to, in to access their license, this application feature will be disabled and they'll receive a notification that their admin has disabled access to it. I'm going to go ahead and click next to go forward. And this gets us into uh, optional settings. Now first here, the profile information. I'll go over this just very briefly. It may be or may not be something that you want to consider. What this here does is it offers an expanded list of what from those who have experience with Active Directory represents group policy objects. Don't be worried or alarmed if you don't fill this out. In many cases, it's not necessary. But if you do decide to begin managing by groups using 365 groups, you may want to include some information in there. Again, this is completely not necessary for most standard users, but I wanted you to be aware that that exists. Now getting here into roles, by default, a new user that's created will be created with a standard user role. From the drop down menu, you can see that that's highlighted and then it gets into the admin roles and that's what we're going to move to next. I'm going to head and click next again. Review the information that's listed in here, license, the user account. The password will be auto generated and then click finish adding. And then I'm going to go ahead and close this out. All right, so the first step is creating and assigning licenses to users. 
the next step is assigning roles and rights to users. There are four main roles and rights that we recommend, which Kevin will go over now. Thanks, Phil. So let's scroll down here to find the new account that and the demo uh, tenant that I created for myself. You can see here I am. This is my username and the license that we had just assigned to that user. So I'm going to go ahead and click on my display name and it's going to pull up a menu on the right side here. I'm going to scroll down to roles. So you can see here it lists no administrator access. That was the default user role that was signed to it. But say we, we want to change it to one of those roles that Phil had just mentioned. I'm going to go ahead and click manage roles. I'm going to click admin center access. And then I'm going to scroll down to the appropriate role. The four roles that we wanted to review are the global administrator, the user administrator, help desk administrator, and the service support administrator. Without going too far down the rabbit hole, administrative roles work on a hierarchy. Think of the global administrator as a super user. You might be wondering what can a global administrator do? The cool thing about this inside 365 and with a lot of things you'll discover when you start exploring the admin center is Microsoft actually does a really great job of explaining what certain roles and functions do. In this particular case, I'm going to scroll over to the information circle and it gives me a brief but fairly descript bit of information. The global administrator has access to all management features and to most data in all admin centers. When you're first starting out, you don't need to go really far down the rabbit hole. You just need to understand that a global admin, again, is essentially a super user. The individuals that create your account when they first set up your 365 tenancy for validation are by default global administrators. Let's scroll on down to user administrator. Clicking the information, we can see that a user administrator can reset passwords, create and manage users and groups, including filters, manage service requests, and monitor service health. The next level up in the hierarchy is this service support administrator, which creates you can create service requests for Azure, Microsoft 365, Microsoft 365 services, and monitor service health. The last is the help desk administrator. The help desk administrator can reset passwords and reauthentication sessions for all non-admins, a small number of admin roles, manage service requests and monitor service health. You'll see that there's several other here and that there's actually a very expansive list which we will provide to you following this webinar. The main takeaway here that I want you to understand is that no matter how big or small your organization is, it's best practice to have a secondary administrator on hand for two reasons. The first, in the off chance that your global admin gets locked out. And the second is, goes back to the old effigy, many hands make light work. By delegating someone as a secondary administrator, you can make your life navigating around and using your 365 tenant that much easier. Now with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump back in here. And the last part that we're going to discuss here, uh, I'm sorry, let me double back here. The next part that uh, we're going to discuss here is understanding roles in 365. Let me jump back into uh, my tenant account. I'm sorry, we just give me one second here. Apologies. 
We just discussed that. Let me jump back in. And the next part that we were going to cover is uh, downloading, downloading and installing, installing Office. Office. Yeah. Great. So the login URL for adding Office, installing Office to your device, you can access that at office.com. You'll log in using your username and password that has been created and assigned for you. Here you'll land, this is the landing page from which you work. Kevin, I'm sorry, you're not sharing right now. One second. Apologies, there we go. Can you see that now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So you're gonna log in at office.com with your username and password. On the landing page, you'll scroll over to install Office. You'll click on the drop down menu and you'll select Office 365 apps. Really quickly here, you'll see a tab for other install options. This will not be a common scenario. The reasoning or logic for installing, going to other install options would be one of two things. The first would be if you needed to download a different architecture or language pack, say for example, that your user uh, was a Spanish native Spanish speaker, you could select your installation pack to be downloaded in Spanish. And if you had a secondary license such as Power BI Pro, that is not downloaded through the standard installation. So I'm gonna go ahead and click the Office 365 apps tab. And as you can see here, I'm getting a prompt to save the executable file. For those of you that are familiar with the old fashioned way of installing Office, the old days of the CD-ROM, the platform that's used is what's called Click to Run. The great thing about the 365 local installation is it uses the same technology. You'll, you'll save the file, you'll run the file, you'll follow the instructions here. As part of completing the installation, what you're going to need to do is actually log back in using your username and password, 365 username and password. And by logging in, that is going to authenticate your subs active subscription ID and allow for the installation uh, to complete. Let me go ahead and close this out. And then we wanted to jump over to adding a custom domain. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, now that you've created users, assigned admin roles and rights, and installed Office, step four is adding a custom domain to your tenant. All right. So adding a custom domain, um, first I want to preface this that what we're going to be showing is just a portion of what's called DNS records. In this particular instance, adding a custom domain will be focusing on what's called a TXT record. So I'm going to go ahead and back at my admin homepage, I'm going to click show all. Settings. Domains. From here, you can see that my default domain is a non Microsoft domain, which many of you will have. I'm going to click add domain. And I'm going to follow the setup wizard here. Again, one of the great features about 365 is that you'll experience as you go through the admin center is all of the learning resources that are presented to you as a part of going through the process. In here, Microsoft introduces you to a quick video on how to add a domain. I would certainly recommend reviewing that additionally before going forward in the steps through the wizard. So I'm gonna jump back in here. We're going to type in the domain that I am leasing from my registrar. A domain registrar, some of you may be familiar with, is an example of is GoDaddy. There are also other 
domain registrars such as Hover, One on One, and HostGator. I do have my Hover account to briefly show you where the record will ultimately be placed. But just note that when you add the domain and the TXT records, you will have a different experience based on who your domain registrar is. So in this particular example, I'm going to type in a fictitious domain. And I'm going to click use this domain. Now you'll notice here that it's walking me through the next step of the process and, and adding a TXT record to the domain's DNS records. This is what we want to have highlighted. We're going to click continue. Now, when you put in your domain name, provided it's not an example like the one that I'm using in an actual real domain, Microsoft may detect who your DNS host is and place that here. In this particular case, it listed other because it did not recognize the domain host by default. It's not a big deal if it doesn't recognize yours, even if you're using a well-known domain registrar. The main focus here is on the TXT records that are listed down here. You'll see TXT name, TXT value, and TTL or time to live. These records right here will need to be added to your DNS records on your registrar's admin page. In this particular instance, I have my personal Hover account in, so I'm not going to go all the way through uh, for the sake of this demonstration. But after logging in, in this particular case, I'm going to my account and into my control panel. It's there that I will you find my, my custom domain. I will select, in this particular case of Hover, to edit the DNS. And then I will go back into the admin center here. I will highlight on the copy record, and I will copy and paste each of these values back into my registrar's homepage. Once I've done that, I'll click verify. Depending on your registrar, it will you will you may experience a difference in time that it takes to properly connect and verify your domain. It can be within minutes. It may be within hours. After it's been verified, you'll see a check mark similar to the one that we saw for the on Microsoft.com domain, and then you will finish out and close the wizard. All right, Kevin, looks like we have a bunch of questions. So let's get back to the re let's go back to the deck and um, so we can get so we can move forward with the Q&A session. Sounds good. Give me one second here to pull that up. OK. And don't forget, folks, we are collecting all your questions and we will address them at the Q&A, which is going to start in about one minute. Okay, Kevin, there you go. Uh, okay, uh, we are providing this resources page in uh, the slide deck. It will be shared with you after this call, uh, along with the recording from this session. Um, but here are a few resources we have. Um, the first part is a getting started guide. It's a step-by-step -step guide with screenshots with exactly what Kevin went through, the four steps in getting started with uh, Office 365. The second one is the digital transformation forum. This is a forum where you can come in, you can ask questions, you can answer questions, you can have conversations. We have guides, we have how-to videos, um, and everything you may need. And I highly recommend you join and, uh, and participate. And by the way, it's actually hosted by this team here, so um, you'll get direct answers from our team. Uh, the third thing is digital skills uh, center training courses. This is where you can get all the courses that you may need for, uh, for uh, Microsoft 365. We have one comprehensive course called a Bootcamp, which basically covers all the apps 
um, that M365 has. And then the last thing I want to share here is that for the next virtual office hour, which is going to be October 22nd, we're going to start touching on security as we progress. Uh, security will be a big issue, so we want to address that there. And it will be the fundamentals of Office 365 security. Okay, um, Vanessa here is actually sharing the links in the chat as well. But like I said, all these uh, resources will be avail available to you shortly after this session. Okay, so I, without further ado, Kevin, let's go to the Q&A session. Uh, along with Kevin and myself, we have Shruti and we have Marilyn to help answer your questions. Okay, so I'm just gonna go down uh, the list in chronological order as they were asked. Okay, um, Wendy, you have a question. I think it was already answered by Shruti, but the next one is by Wynn. Wynn, nice to see you again and, and welcome back. But she asks, I have someone from outside our organization who needs to upload files to me. I understand there is a concept of guest user but I don't know how to set that up or instruct the uh, user how one might use that to be able to upload to me a bunch of files. Um, Kevin, you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, you can add a guest user um, to the account. Um, look if I can jump back in here really quick. I can even demo that. see down here from the menu let me get back out of this really quickly from the drop down menu here i simply click on guest user and then you can add a guest user right here by clicking on the tab here this is, looks like it's redirecting me to uh, azure active directory And then you can simply create a new user here uh, through the prompt. Um, you can also invite a new guest user to collaborate with your organization by clicking on the tab here. Uh, you can also invite guest users in bulk. So here you'll just follow through the prompts. The only item that is needed, which is asterisk, is, is the email address. Um, I would still recommend filling out all these field lines and then of course you can put in a personal message uh, from here. If you have uh, if you're using group management, um, which I referenced earlier, you can add them to a particular group that may change some considerations as far as what the individual guest has access to. So you may or may not want to use that depending on the level of security you need to meet um, their role by default is user. Um, depending on the nature of your relationship again with the individual will dictate what you want them to have access to and the abilities and functions that they have. It will work certainly differently from a partner that's a partner food pantry versus um, a MSP, a managed service provider, and the roles that they would need. Uh, and you can go through the rest of the prompt here. Uh, determine um, any of the settings or usage locations that you want to update, uh, job info. Again, these items you don't need to go that granular. Um, if it's just simply about having an individual having guest access into Teams, uh, this is where this is controlled. Once that's all filled out, then you simply click invite. Yeah, Kevin, stay here for a moment, please. Uh, there's another question by, yeah, you could just go back, Kevin, to the yeah. chair. There's another question uh, by Mary, and she asks, can a guest user only be shared certain files from the main SharePoint folder and not see the other files? Yeah, so the when you're setting up um, sharing in SharePoint, there's a, there's expanded option menus. Now that might take me a little bit more time than I have to show. Yeah. Um, but, um, I think for the sake of that, just know that yes, when you uh, are setting and inviting the guest and then controlling the guest access, um, you'll be able to configure that actually within SharePoint and within your SharePoint uh, administrator. Okay. So this is the SharePoint admin site, which again, I when you go to the main page, you click show all, it'll expand down to the administrative centers here. This is where you'll control on a fine or more granular access 
levels of controls that you have. I'm actually very glad that you brought that question up. Um, so to me, that uh, SharePoint and OneDrive are, are kind of function within the same. They're different components, but SharePoint hierarchically is, that's not a word probably, but uh, is nested within OneDrive. So just know that when you set permissions for SharePoint, uh, going through the SharePoint Admin Center, for example, that SharePoint has the higher hierarchy. So whatever permission sharing that you set in SharePoint, OneDrive will either match that or it will have a permission level less than that. You can never have a greater permission level in OneDrive than you do in SharePoint. OK, great. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so Matt Wolf asked, do you have experience using Microsoft 365 without using Exchange? We're having a lot of issues with mail notification delivery in Teams and OneDrive. And parentheses, we use Google Workplace for email. Um, with that's as far as that, I, I would need to know if, for example, if you've set up like SMTP, if you have mail forwarding from Workspace, if you have a relay set up. Um, that's definitely a follow up question, Phil. Um, I, I think that I'd need to have a little bit more understanding of how the um, mail message exchange is configured. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a little more complicated than that, Matt. So we'll reach out to you directly after this uh, to get more information so we can answer this properly. Uh, the next question is by Evan Perkins. Uh, there are a number of apps in Microsoft 365 that I'm not familiar with. Where can I learn about all these options? Um, if it was covered in part one, I do apologize. So Evan, uh, we're actually hearing a lot about this. It's not just about getting to know and using the apps, but how do we use it? Because there's there are a couple different use cases. So what we'll do is we'll make note of this as a uh, topic that we're going to cover in the future. And you know we're talking about SharePoint, OneDrive, Exchange, um, and the other apps that are out there that comes along with 365. So thank you for that. Uh, we'll make note of that and um, we'll we'll collect the um, topic ideas and which we'll ask at the end as well. So uh, great point. I, I, um, yeah, I would just state. Oh yeah, go ahead, Kevin. I, I was uh, going to say, I was just going to say, if you could just show like quickly where to go on the office just to see the apps that you actually have, that'd be great. Yeah, at perfect. That was actually where I was going to go. This would be a great way to just explore it. So again, going back to the office.com landing page where we had gone through the office install demo. Mm -hmm. If you scroll down there, you'll see an icon that reads all apps. If you click on that, this gives you the ability to view the Office 365, all apps. Tips and tricks is probably a good place to start for Microsoft materials for learning more about the applications. But you can even see here that they give a breakdown um, to a certain degree of what the application is. Um, one of my personal favorites, um, I would have to say, is uh, probably to do uh, and forms. Um, Microsoft Forms is a great way for creating um, polls and quizzes. Um, but if you do go through here, you'll be able to see a full list of all the applications that are available in your license. Again, this is an E3 license. So if you do reference this for the future, you may see something a little bit different depending on the subscription type. Yeah, and there's a lot, so it could be overwhelming. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, the next question from Inna is, so the secondary administrator has global admins uh, has global admin set on, or is it another role? So the, uh, the 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 individual who registers for your account is by associated with the approval for charity billing is by default a global admin unless you are bringing this over from a commercial account. When you create a secondary user, they are just treated as a user. So again, going back to the demonstration earlier, when we've created that user, we'll want to highlight the, we'll want to highlight here, uh, once we've created that role, we'll want to, okay. We'll want to, give me one second here. We'll want to highlight admin center access and then select it. It's not until we've you've you've checked the admin center access box 
and then check the associated box that they're elevated to that level of permissions. That's what RBAC is. RBAC is role-based access control. Think of it as the same hierarchy as maybe even a family, that you have parents and then you have children. So in the case of someone who is going to, again, be acting in that administrative capacity in some way um, as a backup global admin or someone that maybe handles help desk support, that's a great one um, to troubleshoot. Um, if you have an issue that's coming up within your tenant, rather than have everybody in the office chasing after support for it, you could always designate a single person as, say, a help desk administrator, and that will afford them the ability to generate tickets. Again, also, as your CSP, um, I, I would definitely encourage you also to reach out to us um, for, uh, to enable us or allow us to even uh, potentially create uh, an advanced ticket on your behalf. But of course, if you want to self-serve the tickets, you, you, you can as well. Um, and one more thing, Kevin, it's, it's um, the information icon right there. If you mouse over it, it will give you a definition of each of the admin roles. Yep. OK, thank you. Um, John Romano asks, what if any services can TechSoup offer towards setting up and administering M365? Um, Sri, I think that's a good question for you. Sure. Hi. Um, we actually offer an, um, oops, sorry. I was just going to answer another question and I got a YouTube video pop up. Um, we offer an Office 365 um, installation and startup uh, service, so we're happy to help with that. And we also offer a cloud starter kit. So for organizations who want us to actually help them in setting up the account and actually provisioning the licenses and accounts, um, we can do that for you as well. So I'll put up uh, a link in here to um, uh, an intake form and you just set that up and we'll contact you for a meeting and we can get that moving forward. Okay, uh, the next question is, uh, Deb's organization, what about installing MS Project? I mean, can I use this same process for MS Project? Yeah, so MS Project is a standalone SKU, so that's a great question. So going back to uh, the Office page, scroll up here, and Install, that's where you would go to other install options. In this particular case, you're not going to see it reflected in here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on under the Office Apps and Devices, View Apps and Devices. Your project plan subscription SKU that offers the installation will populate here. Um, you can see Skype is here. Um, I would never, I don't recommend that. Microsoft has phased out Skype. But for those that have Power Project, um, Visio, a version of Visio that includes a downloadable uh, desktop application, uh, Power BI Pro, you'll see those populate in here because they're not technically nested within this core subscription. You'll see here that Teams, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, Access, Publisher, etc. are listed here in that Office install. Project will be its own separate installation. Okay, thanks Kevin. Um, the next question is from Kathleen Burley. Kathleen, nice to have you back. Um, and Marilyn, I, I think you could take this one. Is there a difference between adding O365 on the computer versus the cloud? Yes, there is. Uh, there's different um, licensing plans. Some of them will come with desktop applications. Some of them will be Office Online only. Um, for example, uh, some of them like business premium licenses, uh, Office 365, E3, so they will come with both of them. So you can actually install them onto your computer and use them online. Uh, so the difference will be uh, if you use it online, uh, you can access it just by going to office.com, just by having internet uh, anywhere. Uh, and then the desktop applications, uh, you can actually install the um, the apps onto your computer and access them that way. Okay, thank you, Marilyn. Um, okay, so WAG's uh, librarian asks, what's the reason for adding a domain? Um, that, that's where it does get complicated in the process, Kevin, so I think we're going to have a couple more of these questions here uh, regarding domain. Yeah, so 
the txt records so there's a couple different uh types of dns records i'm just going to name them just for the sake of running it through my head but you have txt records which essentially verify ownership of a domain you have mx records which are message exchange records those are responsible for email you have canical name which also function in a similar capacity or c name uh, then you have um, svp and uh, A or AA records. Um, not going to go into details with that. The value of TXT records is in a nutshell. If you had, say, I was K Mulhall at techsoup.onmicrosoft.com, I don't want to log into my 365 account using that. I want to log into my account using my TechSoup address, my K Mulhall at TechSoup. By verifying ownership of the domain, I will be able to update the account. Let's go back into the demo I created here. So when your TXT records are verified, when your TXT records are verified uh, by Microsoft, what you'll have the ability to do is you'll have the ability to modify the domain at which it's named. In this particular case, say that I had wagslibrary.org. Once it's verified, you will see that populate in the drop-down menu, and I can change the primary username or UPN from kmallhall at this long domain handle here to kmallhall at wagslibrary.org. It will also allow you to set, I don't want to get too down the rabbit hole, but it'll also set that domain uh, as your authoritative domain for the tenant. But the main takeaway here is, is that that's the reason you would add a TXT record is so that you can change the login because if you have a custom domain, the idea of constantly typing in whatever it is at dot on Microsoft.com is kind of taxing. Okay, uh, staying on the domain topic, Kevin, Warner asks, is there any additional impact on an existing domain when it is added to Microsoft 365, e.g. if the domain hosts a publicly visible website. OK, so if it's TXT, it's just performing verification. You won't, we do not recommend touching any other domain record type unless you plan on, for example, with the MX record, plan on using Exchange Online or Exchange as, as part of your 365 entitlement as as a mail host so for all intents and purposes introducing a txt record is really just to change the user principal name or the alias that you log in with implications will start happening once you start changing things um, like directions like directing to uh, name servers like or c name uh, mx records uh, a records double a records those are hooks for uh, when you have for example you brought up website if you have a link in a website that redirects to uh, an email address, like an auto formats, um, uh, an email client to push out, uh, that's where you would need to configure A or, or AA records. Um, but if just to change just the usernames, TXT is the way to go. When you start using more, you start running into potential um, services and complications. Um, if you do want to go forward with that, definitely reach out to us. Um, we, we work with a couple of managed service partners uh, that will be able to help if you do want to bring your mail client over into Exchange. OK, um, the next question is from Michael H. The quote, add domain unquote section briefly showed that the records could be removed from the DNS record. Don't understand that. Um, I, the DNS record, it, it's again, it's going back to authoritative um, and like default domains. Uh, DNS can be removed from uh, your 365 tenant. Um, the idea is, is that when you are using DNS records that point to Microsoft, uh, that your registrar is communicating uh, that information. Um, for example, um, when you're configuring uh, SPF, I don't want to get too technical here, but that's for spam protection. Um, when you're configuring that, 
the address is autodiscover.outlook.com. That's the way that the communication works is your DNS host communicates with Microsoft servers uh, as far as when it makes requests uh, through those protocols. Um, for example, mail has its own protocol. Again, I don't really want to get too technical, but yes, you can you can control DNS records at both levels, but the end of the day, your registrar should be the place through which DNS records are are managed and controlled rather than within your 365 tenant. Okay, great. Uh, can a Robin ask, can a username be outside our domain? You're you're talking about like as if, for example, um, if somebody had a Gmail or an Outlook account. So yeah, that would go back to um, as far as a, a guest user, um, but configuring a domain uh, to that, no, like as far as a standard name, because you don't own Gmail, like you domain, you don't own Yahoo. Um, so you, there's no way that you'd have the ability to validate those TXT records. They're owned by Google or uh, to, I unfortunately actually don't know who owns Yahoo now, like maybe AOL, Time Warner or somebody. But um, yeah, you don't have you don't have authority to verify that. So no, if you do want to have uh, an account that operates that way, it would, it would need to operate within like a guest a capacity. But then you're talking about limitations. So I would stick with the on Microsoft domain uh, for the time being uh, if you wanted full user access and privileges to the account. Yeah, and uh, keep in mind, this is all dummy data, but if you could see some of the usernames, the, Kevin used the first initial last name convention, and some people did the opposite, where it's first name and last initial. So uh, that's typically the case for uh, for username with with uh, on Microsoft.com domain. Okay, uh, the next one is Chris from Chris. Uh, this may be beyond the scope of this presentation, but I'm curious where I can review and edit the policies that are pushed down to employees' PCs when they log into our 365 environment. Yeah, uh, that's Azure. I don't, I don't know if we have time to, to go down that role. Um, Azure yeah. Active Directory, you can control conditional access policies. It's actually a great question, and I'd be more than happy to to yeah. uh, follow up on that one. Yeah, we'll follow up. Chris will follow up with you directly on that one. Um, it's since it's a little more complicated. Um, and this is from Millard. Does TechSoup support offer training for Adobe Creative Cloud? I, I can take that and I will Sweet, yep. um, I will just um, respond back to you, Millard, with some resources that you can use there, some courses and some webinars that we've done. Yeah, I, I know they have a ton of resources from that as well, but um, we would address that to you directly as well. Okay, so Jason asks, uh, what's the difference between M365 Business Standard and O365 E3? Uh, can actually provide a full outlay from their GitHub, but Business Standard, um, it's really gonna come down to applications and then to security. Um, uh, items like rights management service, um, for example, um, email encryption um, is a feature that's part of rights management service that's in E3. It's not available in business standard, um, though you could technically, if you have business standard, you could upgrade Azure information protection um, to enable part of that. Um, but it really comes down to applications and then to features. Um, particularly security for E3. That's just, it's a license that's built specifically to address things like HIPAA mm -hmm. uh, and ISO uh, compliances, uh, et cetera. Okay, uh, and we will follow up with more, uh, with more, with the difference differences between these two licenses, which is a very, very common uh, question, by the way, Jason. Okay, Julie Sims asks, I want to use Mile IQ, which is a phone app. How do I set that up? That's a great question. Um, I, I'll I need can, to. I, I can answer that one. Yeah. So um, Mile IQ actually comes within your um, Office 365 or Microsoft 365 solutions. Uh, Mile IQ, for those that might not know, is an application that you can use to log your mileage, and it can help you in terms of if you're getting tax reimbursements and things for it. 
Um, once you download the application of MyLiQ from either your iOS or Android or your Apple phone um, or the Play Stores, um, the way that you log in is using your Microsoft credentials. So it will automatically kind of go towards your account. Um, so that's how you do it for MyLiQ. Okay, thanks, Rudy. Um, okay, Steve Humphrey asks, every time I try adding a custom domain, I get errors. Where can I go to get live help? Uh, personally, I, I would recommend starting with your DNS or your registrar um, to confirm where the issue is um, resting at because if you've copied the records correctly uh, into, um, like I demonstrated my hover account, um, into your control panel, um, if the records match and there's there's an issue with, it's called propagation, um, and you've double checked that, it, it's something that you may want to discuss with um, whoever the host is. It could be an issue but, um, regarding like the TTL I was talking about, the time to live, you may need to change the priority level on that um, from like the standards like 3600 is like it could be zero it could be 3600 um, again this speaks back to some of the differences that you'll experience across registrars um, they don't necessarily all work the same so i would reach out to them first um, if they're not much help um, i you could certainly come back to us and uh, we could discuss possible solutions at that point Okay, thanks, Kevin. Uh, Marilyn, I think you can address this next one from Al Harlow. Is installing Office required or can I run it from the cloud? Um, it's not required. Uh, if you have a license that comes with desktop applications uh, and you haven't installed them, you can use the cloud option. So at office.com, you should be able to see the icons for any of the apps that you want, like Word, PowerPoint, and you can access them through that. Yeah, Kevin, since you have it up, can you go to office.com really quick? I, I see it on your browser. And yep, you can. Oops. Yep, and you can see all the apps that are available. So yeah. you don't have to use the. Know. Yeah, you don't have to use that. Um, you could use the web app uh, as well. But some of the other, uh, the desktop apps are actually very helpful. And I think um, for me, it's a little more helpful. Okay. I would, um, yeah, I, I would just add to that for Phil. You could definitely use the online apps, but particularly for things like PowerPoint and Excel, Excel you'll get a little yeah. bit more functionality, especially if you're a power user of Excel, like Phil and I tend to do, um, yeah. you might want to use the desktop version. Yeah, so there's not complete parity between the desktop versus the web. And so if I really want to get dig down and, and, and start running formulas and stuff, I actually use the desktop. Um, okay, good point. Uh, okay, this <laughs> Millard. Um, if we hate Google Workplace and we want to use Microsoft, is that included here? What is the Microsoft email manager called? Exchange. Um, yeah. So I could certainly uh, understand that. Google Workspace um, is a great solution um, for certain organizations, um, definitely. Um, if you're a Microsoft house, um, it, it, using mail will run through Exchange, Exchange Online. Um, the service is hosted is on Microsoft servers. Um, there is the ability to um, kind of do a little bit of a lift and shift over from Workspace to uh, 365. And again, of course, if that's something you're interested in, um, you could reach out to us uh, directly. We'd be more than happy to walk you through part of that process. Yeah, so at this point, we have about four minutes left to go. I'm going to go through as many questions as I can, but I do want to hear from you folks out there. On, on some of the topics that you want to touch on in the future. So if you want, go ahead and add that to the chat. And so we know where, you know, what the what the hottest topics are, what you want to talk about. Because this these open office hours, these virtual office hours, it's all about addressing your needs and you know what's on what's on the, your mind. Okay. Um, so Vanessa, if you could post that question and then please respond. Okay, and I'll keep on going down the list at this point. Um, so Tanya asks, I would like um, also to learn more about all the apps. Oh, okay. So we'll <laughs> duly noted. Very good timing. Uh, Mary P asks, since nonprofit licenses that were originally available in Volume License Center now have now have to have an on Microsoft.com login, 
-hmm. Is there a guide to process to the process of setting up the whole setup for an organization? I, I think um, if we could um, put that getting started link in from the page that you had, that that actually yeah. includes it all. So um, that could be a good mm -hmm. resource. Yeah, uh, that getting started guide is, is really, really nice. It's step by step, it has visuals, and it should answer a lot of your questions there. Um, Admin Vivian's door asks, where is the link to reach out mm -hmm. for support for uh, on the MS Office 365? And we'll include that link as well. Okay, Shonda Mohammed asks, Will everyone on our staff who is using this platform be required to install the authenticator on their phone? Mm -hmm. Will everyone on our staff, oh, sorry, that's the same question. Yeah, will everyone on the staff be required to install the authenticator on the phone? Okay, uh, did you want me to take this, Phil? Is that all right? Um, so the default modern authentication technique that Microsoft moves or pushes forward is authenticator that said there are other secondary ways of authenticating um, and even disabling microsoft authenticator um, my recommendation would not to be not to do that <laughs> if you can uh, keep that as the standard way through which you access onto your accounts it's recommended um, Having a basic authentication, meaning username and password, just doesn't cut it anymore. Um, I can send you information on, on how it, you can make some potential changes like to that methodology, um, but it will depend in part on your license to the extent at which you can add additional uh, functionalities like SMS, uh, phone call, which really d don't recommend, I don't recommend that anymore. Um, but I would try to stick with Authenticator. Um, yeah. it's, it's just the safest way to ensure the integrity of your tenant. Right. Um, Sorry, just I just more. wanted to add to, to Kevin's uh, answer. Uh, you can also uh, go to my signins at Microsoft.com, and over there you can see uh, how many methods of authentication you have. So if you have a license that comes with multi-factor authentication. You should be able to see text, email, and the authenticator app. So from there, you should be able to delete a method or add another one. Okay, thanks, Marilyn. Um, we have time for one more, and it's from Inna. So she says, so the secondary administrator has global admin set on, or is it another role? And Ronald responded, uh, the answer is yes. You want the you want to you always want to have that backup to the main admin role, mm -hmm. um, like Kevin suggested as well. So but kudos to Ronald for jumping in and answering the questions because this is what it's all about. It's about helping each other, it's about community, and it's about support. So uh, Ronald, thank you for that. Um, and I can I completely concur. Mm -hmm. Um, that concludes this session. There are outstanding questions that we will address. Um, we do have them all listed and we will address um, directly. Please, I invite you to our next session, which is, which is about security. Uh, we will also collect all your feedback here on some future topics. Um, and thank you so much for attending. We will send out recording. We will send out a, um, a link to uh, this deck as well with all the resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, our conclusion. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you for attending, uh, taking time out of your day to visit us. We really appreciate it. So um, I see some claps. So um, I'm going to clap back to the audience. Thank you so much and see you in uh, one month, October 22nd. And just to let people know, we'll send out an email um, with the links afterwards uh, to the deck as well as the recording because I know there's some questions about that. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shuri.